It's I just, was just... Uh, in touch with a Bolivian journalist uh, who gave me kind of a rundown on the situation, but he's been actually, uh, you know, he has family inside the country in La Paz, but he is unable to get there into the country because of the regime change that's taking place in real time. And one of the reasons he's unable to go back is that he's considered um, a leftist and there are right wing mobs in the street who are purging the movement towards socialism's support base um, with the insistence of the army. The army is completely united behind the regime change plot. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but the reason he isn't going back right now is fear for his own safety and the fact that these um, putschist mobs are completely unhinged. Bolivia is sort of a small society. People know each other in La Paz, so he doesn't want to show his face. Um, what we've seen today is a lot of resistance in the street from opponents of the coup, um, you know, the indigenous population, uh, union workers, people affiliated with the MAS party, the Masistas. And the resistance is more organized than in the last days where you saw isolated acts of violence. Um, you know, the, the main social movements are really taking control of the resistance and are trying to make large parts of the country ungovernable. Um, the country is currently not being governed. And in fact, what we saw in the uh, Bolivian parliament, I think it was today, was the attempt by Juan Guaido with makeup, AKA Janine Añez, um, who is a coup leader, right-wing coup leader, uh, to assume the presidency. She declared herself president just like Juan Guaido. Unfortunately for her, all members of MAS, Evo Morales's party, were not present and rejected this uh, completely unconstitutional act. So they didn't even participate in the vote. So her presidency is currently unconstitutional. This is someone who has made uh, racist anti-indigenous comments on camera. There's video going around of her saying, you know, we don't want the Wipala flag anymore. And this is a flag that's a symbol of the indigenous nation to which Evo Morales and a large portion of uh, Bolivia's population belongs. And we've seen in recent days, especially in separatist areas like Santa Cruz, we've seen that flag be burned. We've seen um, members of the military and police uh, take that flag off of their um, sleeves because that flag was incorporated into the Bolivian flag as part of Morales's plurinational vision to incorporate a large portion of the Bolivian population that had been completely left out under previous governments, governments like those of Carlos Mesa, the neoliberal uh, Washington-linked figure who is um, now basically the opposition's de facto candidate, or at least ran as the candidate. So then, so then you um, you have um, you have Camacho, you have a Luis Fernando Camacho, and he is sort of the authentic face and voice of the coup. Um, in the past three days, we've seen him attempt to sort of moderate uh, his tone. Uh, since he appeared in the presidential palace above the presidential seal laying a Bible over the national symbol um, and declaring that, you know, we will cast uh, Satan out of this burned palace and that we don't want Pachamama, who is the indigenous earth god, as part of the country anymore. And, you know, Ben and I wrote about what an extreme figure Camacho is, how he's actually the former leader of a far right, objectively fascist paramilitary whose members are known for their Nazi salutes and racist violence in Santa Cruz, which is the center of, you know, wealth Wait, and I guess you could say whiteness in Bolivia, colonial uh, nostalgia. Um, this is an area where the U.S. has worked to encourage separatism. So Camacho is now kind of touting his ties to um, indigenous uh, forces because there is one small indigenous group that actually appeared with him at his La Paz rally to which Carlos Mesa was not even invited um, and, you know, trying to affect a more moderate stance, calling on people to like respect the laws and not carry out the violence that he whipped up in the past few days. Today, we also saw the dramatic scene of Evo Morales arriving in Mexico 
Uh, he was barely spirited out of the country thanks to the good work of the Mexican foreign ministry. Um, and he landed in Mexico City and recalled um, as soon as he got onto the tarmac the violence that um, he and his supporters had faced over the past few days. His sister's house was ransacked. The electoral committees were destroyed. Voting, vote counting machinery was destroyed. Um, his supporters were shot. His own home was ransacked. Um, governor's homes were burned and many people were threatened um, around him into acceding to the coup. He also mentioned that uh, members of the military were bribed, were um, offered $50,000 to turn on him. Now this brings us to another issue, which is the issue of U.S. support for the coup. I saw some ridiculous uh, post on Facebook by some you know, academic in New York who said, I don't really notice any, uh, you know, U.S. hand here. There was a big coalition out in the streets and we're denying the agency of the people. You know, he's one of the agency mongers. And he called Ben uh, Norton, Ben, who's here with us, yeah. just to not, not confuse Ben with, you know, Ben Franklin or Uncle Ben or anyone else. <laughs> um, he called Ben an Orientalist tanky for, you know, opposing the coup you know, supporting the uh, legitimate democratic rule of the first indigenous. That's because president. I recognize that there's other agencies like the Central Intelligence Agency that is, yeah. there's 100% chance that the Central Intelligence Agency is involved and is, they're the ones denying the Bolivian people their agency. I don't want to get yeah, too far so, afield and focus on one person, but I got into a little Twitter exchange with this individual and he told me he was agnostic on whether or not to call it a military coup. And he was waiting yeah, for more yeah. evidence. So hopefully he's tuning in. But Max, you were well, saying he's well, he's definitely, definitely uh, he's definitely you know certain and completely confident in uh, appealing to the uh, sensibilities of other blue check mark pundits. But you know, leaving that aside, Ben, I wanted I w we should address that particular agency. Um, you know, the CIA, as we know from Philip Ag, who was really the first major CIA whistleblower works through other agencies to sort of soften the blow of its meddling. So one group it works through often is the U.S. Agency for International Development, and this group has pumped millions of dollars into Bolivia. This has been well established thanks to uh, Chelsea Manning, who's in jail, and the cables that she leaked to Julian Assange, who's in jail. And, you know, we know that they've specifically uh, earmarked funding for indigenous groups opposed to Morales, They've earmarked funding for the separatist groups in Santa Cruz, including um, the uh, Santa Cruz Coordination Committee that was led by Luis Fernando Camacho. Um, this is consistent with what Washington does around the world to encourage separatism within countries that are independent and not absorbed into the empire. Um, you can look at what they're doing in Hong Kong and Xinjiang around China as a perfect example of that, or what they've done um, in the Balkans. And I think you know, one of the most fascinating components of the piece that we published yesterday on Camacho is how, first of all, in Santa Cruz, you have this landed oligarchic elite, um, which comes partly from Co Croatia, who left Croatia during World War II because many of them were Nazi collaborators with the Ustasha fascist movement which met with Hitler. It's like I put a picture of Hitler in this piece and it wasn't even a stretch. It's like you're connected to Hitler, okay? <laughs> this coup is connected, you know, there through several degrees of separation but not many. It's not like the Kevin Bacon game to Adolf Hitler. No, this is like the only time where Godwin's law actually it actually understandably applies. It's not like you're like Hitler or I dislike you. It's like no, literally there are two degrees of separation to Hitler here. Yeah, it wasn't Godwin's law. It was just facts, factual reporting. So the Ustasha, um, you know, have people who uh, left when Tito came to power after World War II in Yugoslavia um, and took their money to Bolivia. It's why people like Klaus Barbie, who was a Gestapo torturer who tortured French communists and whose services were repurposed by the CIA... Uh, to carry out Operation Condor, preventing communist infiltration into Latin America. Why Klaus Barbie felt so comfortable when he fled to Bolivia in the 1950s, and he would see the, the Bolivian military and people marching through the streets 
of La Paz with Nazi style uniforms on because many of them were former collaborators or families from Germany or um, the Balkan area. So back to the Croatia connection, um, you know, you have people um, like this guy who was the ringleader of an assassination plot against Evo Morales in 2009. And we'll get into that more. Um, his name was um, um, Rosa, Rosa Flores. Uh, and he himself founded the, uh, the uh, international brigade of the Croatian forces that helped balkanize Yugoslavia in NATO's war in Yugoslavia and then became involved in this plot over a decade later, actually 15 years later, to kill Evo Morales and he himself was was killed in that plot. Um, then you have the mentor of Luis Fernando Camacho who is a Croatian Bolivian um, named Marinkovic um, who is one of the biggest landowners, if not the biggest landowner in Santa Cruz and was his predecessor at the Santa Cruz Coordination Committee. So all of these factors come together and it's so interesting because they're exporting a U.S. operation, a U.S. separatist operation in post-Cold War Yugoslavia to Bolivia and very few people even understand that connection. So of course you don't see that there's a U.S. hand here, but the most direct U.S. hand, and this isn't out yet, but I'm right now I'm editing a piece. We're going to put it up tonight about the the uh, role of the School of the Americas in this whole operation. And this is, I think, where you see the most direct U.S. involvement. Um, because who demanded that Evo Morales step down? It was the military leadership and the police. And we can establish and we will establish that the leadership of the Bolivian police and the Bolivian military down to the chief of staff of the military have been participants in training programs overseen by the U.S., uh, such as the School of the Americas at Fort Bragg, which we all know is the training ground for all of the right-wing juntas that we're familiar with over the past decades and during the Cold War. There's, of course, School of the Americas Watch, so we've been able to cross-check names. Um, and then we have, uh, this piece is not by me, by the way, um, but I don't want to sell out the piece before we publish it. And then you have various um, exchange programs for Latin American police officers that are run out of Washington by the FBI. And so I was mentioning Philip Agee. He demonstrated in the 70s how the CIA often uses the FBI and other agencies to conceal its fingerprints. And that's what's gone on here. They've trained these figures, put them in the most important places in the Brazilian government, of course, they're unelected. And these are the characters who dealt the final blow to Evo Morales, who said that he was almost killed and he owes his life to the Mexican president for rescuing him. So uh, that's that's the situation as as I see it. Um, and I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen in the next in the coming days. The situation as uh, my Bolivian source told me is fluid. Um, I hope Evo Morales said that he left to avoid violence. Um, but it seems that some sort of violence could be inevitable, particularly from the right wing. Um, in Bolivia, we now have uh, someone who's maybe not playing as important a role, um, but is playing a very public role and is an agent of destabilization uh, that we've exposed at the gray zone named uh, Janice Vaca Daza. And she works for a group um, that has a terrible record in the region, Venezuela especially, but also in Bolivia called the Human Rights Foundation. And the Human Rights Foundation takes the same role as the National Endowment for Democracy, but it's not directly operating under the auspices of the US government. Um, so it's like one degree removed, which allows uh, much more freedom of operation, less, um, uh, I would say, less accountability by Congress. It's not that they apply very much accountability to this at all when like the New York Times supports every regime change operation. But they're, uh, found, they were founded by somebody with Thor Halverson. His father was a right wing Venezuelan politician who was a CIA asset um, and was an oligarch. And um, 
Halverson was a campus Republican activist. When he got out of college, he started um, funding, uh, he founded this group with money from Peter Thiel, who's this, you know, the right wing Silicon Valley billionaire who said that he opposes democracy and women shouldn't have the right to vote. Um, he has like the right wing foundations are supporting him, but also he's gotten support from Amnesty International, a lot of liberal groups. And he has what's called Davos for Dissidents, where all of these regime change activists from around the world get in a room every year in Oslo and start exchanging tactics. And I think this is why we see so many of the same tactics in Hong Kong, Ukraine, um, and so many in Venezuela and so many of these places. Um, and Daza poses... She's a human, uh, human Rights Foundation Freedom Fellow. Um, she was trained through this group run at Harvard. That was such an obvious um, you know, operation. It was basically just set up for her through Sergei Popovich, who's another regime change trainer who helped train Juan Guaido. And she helped launch the coup in August. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers, but there are all these protests that started out against Bolsonaro during the, when the Amazon was on fire. And the protests were then kind of, they took an off ramp thanks to the work of Daza, who started this SOS Bolivia hashtag online through her NGO Rio Stepi. And they began protesting in Europe and the US outside the Bolivian embassy and trying to blame Morales. And she said that, you know, she's a nonviolent kind of environmental activist. She's been trained in nonviolence at Kent State, she said. She studied it. But all of a sudden, in the past weeks, we started to see her at the barricades alongside these right-wing fascistic forces of Luis Fernando Camacho. And so the mask was completely lifted. And now she's just basically cheering on the regime change operation the whole time when a few months ago, the BBC was saying, you know, environmental activist uh, Janice Daza says that there should be more aid. So, so the coup has progressed through various stages. And now the mask is off on her on the Human Rights Foundation, obviously doesn't favor human rights. It's a regime change foundation. And finally, um, one thing that we Wait, reported way, in our to piece- jump in, To jump in really quickly, yeah. Max, actually, we have it yeah. right now. Janice jump Daza over. was just on CNN to push this coup propaganda. And she, she quoted MLK, I mean, so- Well, she compared it to what's happening exactly. to the US civil rights movement. It's like this racist coup where they're burning indigenous flags. She compared it to like getting beaten at lunch counters to protest segregation. And that's just, how is that allowed to happen? I mean, yeah, and, and another to mention here actually, which we disclose in this article, you can find at the gray zone. And I, I had it up for people who were looking at the live stream here. Uh, and what's another crazy thing is she did a TED talk and her TED talk on resisting authoritarianism in Bolivia was sponsored by the Spanish embassy. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that when you're a Bolivian and your event on the supposed dictatorship of your democratic elected government is sponsored by Spain, which colonized Bolivia, it's not a very good look. It's also that, you know, when you do a TED talk, you're an asshole, <laughs> just period. But uh, so, so the other, the final point I was going to make was that, you know, the Human Rights Foundation has been active in Bolivia for a long time. And I talked about this assassination plot that involved um, four dual nationals from either Hungary and Croatia or Ireland uh, who were just known fascists. Um, but allegedly, according to the government investigation of the coup, uh, Ugo Aja Melgar, who was the founder of the Human Rights Foundation subsidiary in Bolivia, was the one who brought Rosa, the, the coup leader, and he had to, um, Aja had to take asylum in the US. The US government immediately gave him asylum and he had to flee because of his implication in this assassination and terror plot. Um, I mean, that, that's, there it is. Janice Daza's predecessor in Bolivia was implicated in a plot to kill Evo Morales. And now here she is at the barricades and cheering on this regime change operation. And this group, you know, just look at coverage outside of alternative media about it. I've been writing about them for years, but just, just check out your New York Times and Washington Post BBC coverage of this group. It's just referred to in the same terms as Amnesty International. It's just another human rights group. Um, so people, again, I mean, if you don't see US 
hand in this coup, it's because you're, you have blinders on. I mean, it's, it's just right there before your eyes. 